and using that for fitting multi cloud simulations. Thank you. Um, maybe we can switch this slide. Okay, thank you. Um, so yesterday I was showing you how to, I mean, how uh, LHXAS can give you a lot of information. And oftentimes to analyze the data, I mean, the more information you have, the more complicated your spectrum, more features, then you have to rely on, on some calculation. Turns out that multiple simulations are a great tool because in your Hamiltonian, there is some things that are kind of like the same. And what you are really, for example, in a AB initial calculation, what you are really optimizing through the self-consistent field, for example, will be the radial part, the radial components of, uh, and then we make it use empirical parameters, or at least that's one approach that we are trying, make it empirical parameters, and then you try to fit manually until you, the, the simulation looks um, very familiar with the, with the experiment. Um, it could take a few hours, or it could take months or years, depending on how many parameters are there to fit. And you always have the question of um, if it is, because it covers actually quite a bit of the, the of the of the theory, it captures a lot of the active space. Uh, so the physics are right, but it's just uh, the empiric, because of the empirical component, sometimes, uh, people see simulations like you won't have a unique solution or perhaps uh, you will have a many combination of parameters that can lead to the same um, kind of description and then you will have to figure out which one is the, the best uh, description. So uh, because of this, then this is an effort to try to make it more automatic and also to explore more of the solution space for these parameters. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through, so maybe this is the two slides that are more, so I'll, I'll go quicker in the other slide, but a little bit slower in this one because it shows uh, how the algorithm actually works. So first you need to generate, let's say you have five parameters. Here I'm showing, well, actually let's make it more simple. In reality for this compound, we use five parameters but let's focus in only two of them, which is the DS and the 10 DQ. As we were discussing yesterday, these two parameters are related to the crystal field, 10 DQ, the octahedral crystal field, followed by a distortion, gentler distortion. For this, we also optimize the DT and also the reduction parameters on the Slater integrals, which is the nephilaucetic effect. And so I'm showing only two here, and then let's say you, Originally, you start with a range of DS that you more or less know where this should be, and also a, a large range of 10 DQ, as large as possible, let's say. And then you select a step size that is not so uh, precise, so you don't have high precision at the beginning. And what the algorithm actually does is gonna calculate the simulation. By the way, these simulations take seconds now. I mean, it used to take longer, but now it takes uh, a few seconds. So that's the, the advantage. Um, and so for every point, it basically is a combination of all these parameters, all these five parameters, two in here. And then there is a complementary uh, set of parameters, which is, for example, your broadening, or your scaling factor or your energy shift. And these parameters are actually completely optim optimizable by a nonlinear least square method. So for every point, it creates a simulation and then it optimizes these free floating parameters, including, for example, composition. Like if you have two sides, then it can also, the composition is come at play very handy here. Um, I'll show you an example of that uh, later on. Um, and so 
it completes the whole grid and then it uh, basically takes the best selection of the best uh, fits, a region where the best fits are. And then from there, based on the average and the two standard deviations, it creates a new grid, more precise with the same number of points and so on and so forth. But, uh, after five cycles, then you have a very localized solution. In this case, we have this uh, spectra for this complex, which is a uh, uh, lithium uh, manganese oxide, which for a long time couldn't be fit uh, properly with only one uh, simulation. They needed to mix two states or propose two states. Uh, but now we have a, uh, the solution for this complex, which is very highly distorted by Jan Teller. And that might be explaining why uh, this material that is used in batteries in the 90s used to, like the battery used to expand and then it will come out of your computer, for example. And now they use cobalt, right, for that reason. Um, because of this huge Jan Teller distortion that it will be present in the discharge or, uh, I mean, going from the manganese four to, to manganese three in the material. So uh, this has uh, consistent with the optical also spectroscopy from uh, which is about two electron volts, the first transition, which is more or less what this uh, transition is, for example. Um, so this is just, uh, actually I already described this. So the, the, what, what is in the grid, every point in the grid is the calculation of all these sticks. And complementary to that, there is a, um, a minimization of this function, which is the data minus the model, which is includes uh, some broadening scaling factor energy shift, which are the free floating parameters to be optimized. So we have this um, electric, electronic structure related uh, parameters that could be part of the grid and this other set that could be uh, free floating parameters um, which is what actually defines at the end what are the best fits for this. Uh, we needed to do, um, interestingly, we needed to, uh, uh, and, and actually that was a good point. So it was in the review process already. And so they say, what if you try, because it was actually not tried, uh, to first calculate some spectra from very well-defined ground states. And then you try to, your algorithm to get there. So this is what we did. Um, and it was very nice exercise because it made me realize that LH is extremely sensitive to electronic structure, not only in the spin state, but also in the details of fine tuning these uh, uh, crystal, um, crystal field parameters. So here is just a, a little going through D0 to D4 example. And for every set, so it's very different for every configuration, but for every set we do two, two uh, broadenings. One that is very broad, uh, let's say 0.8 electron volts and the other one that is uh, uh, narrow. The broad is to test if, uh, we have actually multiple solutions because of the broadening will obscure some of the features there somehow, and maybe that will be problematic for the algorithm. Um, so this is the exact parameters that we use for the simulations. I mostly, for, I mean, this is the base on hard tree fog calculations and then scale to 80% the electron electron repulsion parameter. Spin orbit coupling we switch to zero in all this series. And only for the 2P, we, we leave it on because it's extremely important at, at 100%. And uh, we use this parameter, set of parameters for the crystal fields. Um, we got, uh, so basically now the block, the, the dotted black line is a calculated one. The blue one is what, what the solution that it was reached by the um, um, by the algorithm. So this is the case of chromium. 
this is the case of vanadium. And more importantly, perhaps is the table where it shows. So the scaling factor was a, a parameter. So we use 80% of the, whatever the hard to values are. And we are coming back to almost 80%. The value of the, the crystal fields are almost there. Just a few examples that are some um, uncertainty, but, but I mean, the the solution, the real calculation is actually there. So it's part of this uncertainty. Uh, the broadening is also recovered. I mean, it's practically there. It's either the narrow data set or, or the broadening da data set. So we also try some iron two systems, for example, high spin and low spin. Again, narrow and broadening data set. And um, these four that corresponds to different ground state in a iron two uh, D four H system. So we we run first these calculations, which is ground state with the program that I showed you yesterday, to identify where we have a different ground state, and then from there run a very well defined ground state, and we will have a different spectra in each case. And this is a difficult one because it is a specific value of ds that and dt. I mean, the dt in all these cases has to be zero, so it's a tough one. So for all these complexes, again, it reaches to the right uh, value of. There is as this is one of the largest deviations from that, and is a little bit correlated with the broadening. So that's for the broadening data set. This other one is also an, an outlier, but for the most part is fully recovered. So it's not only sensitive to the spin state, but also to the details of the every crystal field parameter. Yeah. So who do you estimate the, the time? Uh, based on the number of good fits that we obtain at the end. So based on the, let's say all the fits that are looking quite well, so we do just an average and standard deviation. It's the same for the two methods, the hard to fog and the crystal field? Uh, yeah, well, the hard tree fog is, uh, so it's a library that we use for the later integrals, and then we scale it by the nephil effect, which is based on certain level of covalency, certain level of covalency. In this case, we use 80% and we needed to reach to that level. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is not clear yet for me. Uh, why we scale the factor like eighty percent? Ah, yeah. So, well, in this uh, simula in this particular set of uh, calculations, it doesn't really matter uh, if we scale it or not because we are just trying to arrive to these simulations, for, uh, trying to prove that the al the algorithm works to to reach the the right calculation and at the same time showing how uh, sensitive it is this technique to to the electronic structure. But um, we scale it to it, normally it is a scale to 80% just because hartree fock overestimate this parameter. And then at 80% at is exactly the atomic level. And then going beyond that, it will be the covalency that it will be exhibited. Um, so in all cases, this is looking pretty good. And um, there is two that we could consider a little bit outliers. Then this is very difficult one because it's a case where we have a mixed state, but it's exactly at this value of, uh, so we have a crossover between a high spin and low spin exactly at this value of 10 dq. And this is where, so if you look at the spectra, it changes exactly at that point. I mean, it's, it, it mixes between what you see afterwards and then what you see below that value. And so it's very difficult because you have to exactly get 2.27. So And there are certain, this, this uh, mixing of two states is because of spin orbit coupling. 
So th these are all simulations, right? Yeah. If, do you have any example or like, I mean, for this kind of difficult systems to study experimentally, like some correlation to our experiment? Yeah, yeah. No, the first one that I show is the experiment. We have some others, but they ask us to prove that this actually works based on systems okay. that we define and calculate and then see if the algorithm can can actually find the solutions that we in this case in this case we actually took this the broadened set and the narrow set and see if the algorithm can reach to that uh, because it's a very difficult one like very high precision so we didn't get in this case we didn't get the exact solution but we found very something very interesting uh, i had a question right uh, that kind of behavior will be something that will be seen in a spin in a crossover in a spin crossover uh some might be well yes because at certain temperature then you have the mixture of the two but in this case you have two states that are very close in energy and just by reaching certain temperature then you will populate both and you will see the spectra of both yeah okay thanks uh, we didn't find the exact solution. So, for example, in, we run three times the narrow data set. So we got very close in all these cases with different uh, values. And also in the case of the broadened data set, we got also different values. However, we found something very interesting here. A very strong correlation between 10 dq and the scaling of the Slater integral. So it's a one-to-one -one correlation it's in a straight line, which means there is not only the value that we propose at 2.27 exactly, but it could be more value, any value of 10 dq, and correspondingly, any value of Slater integrals, which are measuring the electron-electron repulsion. It's a totally straight line, this one. Turns out that the situation of um, of a spin crossover was studied first by Griffith, Orgel, Tanabe, Sugano, and then later by Kramers and Crony, and they found exactly the the pairing energy, the spin pairing energy, at which there is this transition. Turns out that this energy. Uh, exactly coincides with this slope. So, so the, the algorithm was able to find this correlation between these two, which is nice. So this is uh, uh, a value between 10 dq and the Raka parameter, which is equivalent to the Slater integrals that they reported in 1971 with um, configuration interaction calculations. And this is what we got ourselves for this slope, let's say. Um, so that the agreement is pretty good in this case. So that's quite, that's kind of nice that we didn't have a single solution, but all the solutions that can uh, reach to this uh, equivalent, uh, I mean, a, a spin crossover situation. And then we explore also the case where we have a mixture of mixed balance. So imagine we have like a Prussian blue kind of thing. So we have a high spin iron three, low spin iron two in the proportion of four to three. Just to see if we can find exactly the parameters of each side and also to find the proportion, the composition of the two sides. And again, Turns out that we found, so the four to three ratio, it was found by, by the algorithm and also the individual parameters that actually fit the, the spectrum. Either if it was the very uh, high resolution or not so high resolution. So that actually demonstrates that is um, a good, a robust algorithm to reach to the solution and also how sensitive LH is and 
in general, how the multiplet simulations actually is not that you will find different solutions, but is when you find the solution, either it's, if it is by this method or by other method, is almost like the solution for most cases. Uh, so this is another uh, example that we show for this material. It doesn't have too much resolution. This one has two sides, one octahedral and one very highly distorted that doesn't correspond to any symmetry. And again, we find the right proportion consistent with a, so this is a free floating parameter, the composition. And again, we found not only the crystal field parameter, but also, so this is real spectra in this case, as the first image as well. Um, and then this is very interesting project in collaboration with um, a former student of Frank de Croix in the Netherlands. Uh, now a professor in France, uh, Eva Elmager in Paris. Um, so this is um, a film of magnetite. And basically the idea is to find, because magnetite has three sides of iron. So it has an iron three octahedral side. It has an iron two distorted octahedral side by the Jan Teller effect. And it has an iron three tetrahedral side. Uh, and the thing that we want to know is exactly what kind of distortion we have in the iron two side. Very difficult question. But he came out with a very smart experiment. I'll explain in a, in a minute. So one this possible distortion is through the C3 axis, which could be um, elongated or compressed to reach to D3D symmetry, or it could be through the axis, the C4 axis to reach to D4H symmetry. So to find out which, uh, because this is this can explain the origins of the magnetism in the Van Vleck equations, for example. So it's, it's important to know what kind of uh, distortion it has, and also uh, the magnitude of each uh, parameter. So basically, I mean, I'm not gonna go through this in too much detail, but turns out that in XAS spectroscopy, there is nine fundamental spectra. But the problem is that we cannot measure um, separately, all of them. It would be super nice if we could. And this is where the brains of Eva comes into play because you find a way to measure four of these components and to be sensitive to these uh, distortions. So this is the Fermi Golden Room, which we have spoken. This uh, actually is um, the complete nine there. But actually, X-ray absorption is, uh, it could be, um, so we can create polarizations, right? Mixing the um, X, Y, and C component of the electric dipole to make a polarization as, as, uh, as we found convenient. And so given a certain polarization, then we will have a nine, and these nine uh, uh, fundamental spectra. And so the experiment that was performed, well, there was two experiments that were performed, actually join uh, these experiments in Diamond. They have a super nice setup for doing these kind of experiments. Very highly controlled the uh, magnetic field in every orientation and also to create polarizations as needed. So this is the field. And basically for dichroism, so this is, was uh, dichroism. You need a contrast between two measurements. In this case, we have polarized light going through the sample. And it could be measured at, at zero degrees first and then at certain degree afterwards. And that's your element of dichroism. Uh, I mean, the, a certain angle for the magnetic field. And it's what I mean here. So, we did two experiments, the one with a linear horizontal and another one 
uh, the linear horizontal at 30 degrees rotated. This linear uh, rotated 30 degrees can see four elements of the conductivity tensor or four fundamental, uh, four of the nine fundamental uh, spectra, XIS spectra, so that's nice. So this is two examples of, of the dichroism uh, subtracting a certain angle here minus the reference. Uh, and now for the analysis, we have to put the simulations of every side at the same time. Fitting uh, not only the XMC, so we also took the XMCD and the regular XAS. So we fit simultaneously the XMCD signal and two of the XMLD signals in both polarizations. And so we fit simultaneously all of these to agree with all the fitting parameters. And so what we found is that XAS, I mean, we almost reached to the same. So we assume, oh, that's the other thing. We assume D4H or we, so we run this assuming it's D4H or assuming it's D3D. And um, as you could see, XAS is not very informative because both are very similar. Same with XMCD. So this is again, the simulations of three sites being fit to the experimental. Um, but the XMLD is extremely sensitive to tell us that D3D fits uh, better. So you have to consider that the the way that is uh, being put to these simulations is at maximum the third of this. So imagine to have the, the ability to, to see the effect of changing one side, uh, one kind of distortion for another distortion. So this one agrees uh, much better. Um, but uh, we, we so, so I'm, here I'm showing the horizontal actually for all the angles that we measure. So you could see that the linear horizontal is not very sensitive in the sense that because we only see one, uh, one spectra, one of the nine fundamentals, but very similar in D4H and D3D. But when we go to the L30 signal, I mean L30 polarization, then we see very big difference between the D4H side and the experimental, so you could see that there is something missing there. But in the D3D, it nicely reproduces the full series. So it's quite, quite nice. Another thing we found was the magnitude of the parameters. 10 dq, d sigma and d tau that I described yesterday for the D3D site. And I was showing this one, this image yesterday, which is a correlation between the distortion, how much, um, so this one is uh, compressed side. This one is elongated side with respect to the octahedral side. And we, we find that these parameters that we found are consistent with a compression of six degrees. Uh, this alpha parameter is uh, um, how much uh, how many degrees this angle increases with respect to 90 degrees. So for example, it's 90 degrees is zero. When it's 10, uh, this angle is 100 degrees, but the values that we found is consistent with six degrees approximately. So that was nice to find uh, as well. And that will be consistent with this crystal field diagram now Based on this crystal field diagram, now we have to make sense of using the Van Bleck equations to the origins of the magnetism in this material. So that's uh, um, basically what um, what we have so far achieved with this uh, algorithm in terms of an experimental. But now I, I think I still have time, right? This is uh, quite new. This is a collaboration with Thomas, actually. Uh, <laughs> right. 
<clears throat> a big question might sound one further for the simulation for the compelled spectrum. Yeah. Uh, the question might sound a little mean, but, but it's, it's in a right. yeah, yeah, yeah. educating way. So the big question here is always, uh, how good does the simulation have to be for you to call it valid? Uh, so, I mean, this looks quite impressive, uh, mm -hmm. to be honest. Right. Uh, I will say... Mean, of course, if you look yeah. at like, very detailed, then they're not perfect. Yeah, for example, here, for yeah, example, exactly. here. And so how good does the simulation have to be for you so that it's acceptable? Yeah, that's a very good question because you could see that there is, I mean, this level of detail, to, uh, to reach this level of detail in uh, when you are actually trying to fit all the four simultaneously with all the size, with all these parameters, it's extremely hard to get to this. However, and you know, in this case, we didn't put all the stuff that is required to make it even better, which is charge transfer parameter. So basically here, it's, we are assuming that these sites are mostly ionic, just to simplify the problem. And I guess these uh, details um, are just uh, the, the chart, what is, what is uh, the charge transfer parameters, I, I will think, but uh, um, I mean, we tried this uh, many, many times. We have to use a cluster for this one, by the way. So this we use, normally we have all, all of these in MATLAB, but for this, we have to use a cluster because it's just too many parameters. And we had to repeat several times just to make sure that we arrive to the same solution. And yes, we are arriving consistently over and over to the same kind of solution. So, um, I mean, I cannot say that is, uh, we are uh, absolutely sure, right? That this has to be the parameters or that they have the right precision. They, perhaps they can even fine tune a little more. But um, we accept this on the fact that we don't introduce charge transfer parameters and perhaps some of the sites need a little bit of that. And so the, this one, I mean, this, this is probably more interesting for this audience and you will see why. Uh, because our intention of applying the grid algorithm in SAINS is to go directly from the structure to the shape resonance that you see in SAINS without actually measuring the complete exaps. Um, so here we, we run actually FEV simulations instead of multiplet simulation. We run FEV simulations based on a structure. So your, your grid parameters are now directly structural parameters in a model. For example, our bond distances or our angles directly. So here I'm showing just this, uh, a, a few tests that we made, but now we are planning to actually use the same approach to construct first our artificial spectra, our calculated spectra, and see if, if the algorithm can go to the right structural model. So that will be nice to, as a start point. Um, I guess our selection of first compounds were not completely ideal because there are many that are lattices. So, um, so as you will see, so one of the selections that we made is the uh, ferrocyanide. Uh, um, so this is actually the, the solution already. So we have missing a little bit here and a little bit there. And I think it comes from the potassium because we only use, we only optimize the iron to carbon and the carbon to nitrogen distance, but we are missing here the uh, potassium that should be kind of nearby because uh, it's a counter ion and perhaps this is making up for it. So this is the bond distances that we found. I forgot to put the the, uh, the standard deviation which is uh, point zero, less than 0 0.01. And then we do the same. Well, this one is uh, it's a high spin iron complex 
I actually don't know the counter ion, but it's going to be needed as well. Actually, this is a lattice. It's a lattice. And, and so we could see that is a lot of things missing here because we need this extra resonance that comes from iron iron, for example, and more, more related to the lattice structure. So we have to create that model as well. But I, I really would like to go and to explore first molecular systems. And we have a molecular system here, which is kind of nice. So this is the, well, ignore this pyramid. So this is a porphyrin ring. So we section the porphyrin ring so you take this element, usually like, you know, when you have aromatic compounds or fragments of your whole molecule, they're actually very robust, like histidine is, I mean, the, the internal structure of histidine is not gonna change much really. So it's, uh, so we take it as a full fragment and, and then we measure, I mean, we, we explore this structural change of going a little bit uh, more distance or less distance. So we took this other carbon as another fragment at, the, at exactly the same distance, for example, it, but it could be also different. And we found this, um, this solution, including the double feature here for this molecule. So that's uh, kind of nice to, to have that. Um, and then here, I mean, the iron to phthalocyanine, for example, is known for having uh, this to, to be stacking. And it seems like it really needs the stacking because it's missing this, this resonance and then it's missing some other elements as well. So it, it's like a pi stacking thing and maybe it's required that also in the, so this is measuring a powder. Um, and usually when you do films of phthalocyanine, um, they adopt uh, the structure of stacking as well, but uh, in powder also is uh, apparently important here to do. So this is just our first four trials for this, but uh, seems to be promising, right? Like if we manage to, to feed the structural models to the same, then it could have a saving a lot of time also, at least in the, as a first approach, right? Like as, as I was seeing uh, this morning, for example, for C, then you create your model, then you fit your structural parameter, and then you get like at least a first um, approximation, let's say. And I think with this- uh, Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, great. Questions? Yes. Um, <laughs> I just let me just uh, acknowledge uh, the group, which is most uh, a lot of the students here. Then our collaborators and the funding from CONACYT and the Supercomputing National Laboratory, which is the one we use for the magnetite. And now, yes, questions. <laughs> so yeah, I, I uh, re really great results. I'm really impressed by the work. Oh, fantastic like like i'm i'm usually telling like all the information we extract from exos is already in the zanes part but we cannot extract it there easily and uh but people are working on it and then you show that and it's like yeah there there, there it is right it's perfect it's great mm -hmm. um so yeah my first question is so so maybe as uh, so this is now all done in solids right yes so I, I have always found solvation effects to be very important. Um, so the quest, first question would be, yeah. So have you tried it in, in solvents or how might, do you think it could help? The easiest that we will, I mean, we have this, the uh, ferrocyanide, but we also have data now of ferrocyanide in water. So it would be nice to see if, uh, if we see something different. We, I, I guess we will see something different. Maybe Thomas, no? It's a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. And then um, the second one, I don't know if you need it, but uh, have you tried it with zinc? Because it's like- uh, With zinc? It, it, with zinc uh, compounds, like it's eliminating a lot of the problems that uh, unoccupied, but 3D holes include into the, the calculations and could also be a, a nice case study. 
yeah, that will be nice to uh, as um, yeah, I was just uh, thinking that perhaps we need to focus for now in molecular system, including C, including other metal, and uh, and then leave, for example, the the crystal structures for later. I mean, we put uh, this, this uh, data is um, um, kind of like um, used over and over the solid ones for different purposes, so that's why we were using it, but perhaps it's a bad idea to prove this uh, methodology. So uh, it's a very nice suggestion to go to more metals and to try to, to, to use the different system, right, molecular system. Uh, Nils, maybe give you a little bit of the, of the history why we, why we started that. And it's, it's connected to <clears throat> like the mixing experiments that we do together. And their iron plays a big role. And in these experiments, you don't have time to, carry, to measure the exons. It's pretty much out of reach. And so you measure the free edge, so that gives you a lot of information. But if you want to look at intermediates and you, want to, you don't really know what it is, you would love to know the structure. And you will always measure the shape of it. And so then Mario came up with a direction and you just have fitting it. And so that's where the whole thing started. That's when we started with iron, uh, ah. because it's one of our systems. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, it's just two comments, actually. On the ferrocyanide stuff, actually, we worked a lot in this, uh, on this system, like um, 20 years ago, something like that. And um, we did the zines, exactly what, we, what you did, uh, but we did it on the other side as well. Uh, you, you, you know, you, yeah, on the... Yeah, on the nitrogen side, because we put another metal over there, mm -hmm. and then you have tra charge transfer. Mm -hmm. And so we did uh, the edges from the iron, the other metal, the nitrogen, and the carbon. And, and we used that actually to simulate it on the same time to try to get a picture of the uh, molecular orbitals and the, trash and the charge transfer between the iron, because the electrons are traveling through mm -hmm. this ball. Um, so it's like a Prussian blue kind of. Well, thing. yeah, no. it was it, it, it was a specific metal on the other side, as you can imagine. Right. Right. But it's exactly like Prussian blue. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, and uh, and I remember that was a lot of stuff. And the second remark is: um, um, Are you aware of the the work by uh, en Enrique Sanchez in Sevilla? Uh, no, no, because um, he's doing uh, actually we. we, we we're working together. Um, he's trying to model zines uh, from uh, ab initial molecular dynamic potentials and uh, and and FEF. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, both. So it's an informed uh, FEF kind of thing, like based. I mean, the DFT maybe. Yes, exactly. Finds the possible structure. Exactly, exactly. So. Um, so he looked at cobalt, uh, he, he looked at um, uh, all, the, all other sorts of cations in water. And just to complete your remark, yes, the solvent effect is very important. So, so yeah, uh, maybe I can send, him, send you uh, your, his email and our, our oh, yeah. contact, yeah. but he's doing a lot of that. Yeah, it would be nice to see. And I, I should mention also that since this algorithm um, is possible to find to to have the composition as a variable that can be optim optimizable. Then, then it's possible to also explore the uh, molecules that have several sizes at the same time, and then see what yeah. what the weight of each is, for example, of every model. I'll, I'll send you his uh, his name, and you can look thank at you the so much. Graph. Maybe one last question. No, no student wants to roast their behind. <laughs> okay, then let's thank Mario. Thank you. We'll come to our last speaker of the workshop. Hi, we need to say good. I think it's if it streams, it remains recorded. So. Okay, so we, we will say goodbye to the people who are 
watching us on the streaming. Thank you for joining us these three days from afar. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> all right, thanks a lot. Uh, last presentation of the whole, whole workshop. Uh, we thought we have lunch at three, so I try to be a little faster. <laughs> I, I won't be done at three, uh, but I give my best. <laughs> <laughs> Well, almost, almost. Uh, oh, I cannot. Um... All right. So um, let me quickly motivate <clears throat> what I'm, what we're trying to do here. So what we, what you'll be interested in is, can we follow a chemical correction in time in like ambient conditions? Uh, the way it's done usually or often is like what Kelly said before. You know, it 